कम नहीं करेगा So, whatever Dharma discourse we may engage ourselves in, we should have the perfect kind of motivation of this disturbance. So, from the side of the teacher himself and the audience, both should have pure motivations. If we tinge our motivation with that of the eight worldly concerns, then it doesn't serve the purpose of giving Dharma teaching. And so, on the part of the teacher, one should not have any selfish motive, nor wishing for mere peace of having overcome just the reflective emotions and so forth. And then from the side of, on the, on the part of the disciples, you should have the motivation not to seek any pleasure of this life to gain pleasures, but to have the motivation to reach liberation and omniscience and so, from both the sides, the teacher and the audience, we should have this pure motivation to benefit others. So, for that reason, let us recite this verse of taking refuge and bodhicitta. So the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha are our objects of refuge. So by taking the refuge, the purpose of that is to reach the unsurpassable enlightenment of Buddhahood and to serve other sentient beings. And for the sake of leading all sentient beings to liberation. With that kind of motivation, we should make our prayer. So all of us, we have met with the teaching of the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha. So having met such a teaching, Whatever teachings the Buddha has given, he gave them from his own experience to lead us to the same goal of 
full enlightenment that he himself has reached. So we should keep this in mind. So whatever Dharma practices we may be doing, just as the Buddha has attained the state whereby he has overcome both the obscurations of knowledge and afflictive emotions, mental afflictions, we should also seek the same goal. And therefore, this verse is very powerful prayer. As it is said in Uttara Tantra, Mahayana Uttara Tantra Shastra, the Buddha's uh, uh, so what this verse shows basically is that all of us sentient beings have this element of Buddhahood, element for Buddhahood, there is a potential for Buddhahood, whereas our mind is uh, polluted by the mental afflictions and other defilements, they, these defilements are not, imp uh, not in the intrinsic nature of the mind itself. And when you uh, develop the antidotes to them, you'll be able to make this Buddha uh, potential manifest, realize it fully. And therefore, this Buddha potential or the Buddha nature, as it's usually called, uh, becomes manifest. So we have this within us naturally, whereas this is with, uh, n not tinged in its intrinsic nature by the mental afflictions and other defilements, such as uh, our grasping at true independent existence and things and beings. And then these uh, uh, defilements leave, their stains, residual stains are uh, called the obscuration to knowledge, cognitive obscuration, which obscures our mind from reach uh, and attaining omniscience. But the clear light, luminous nature of the mind itself is without any stains in, in, in its intrinsic nature. But through the application of our antidotes to the defilements, we'll be able to make this clear light luminous mind manifest. And therefore, the state of Buddhahood, which is free from all defilements, all obscurations, all stains, spiritual, emotional, psychological, and so through that purification of these defilements, we'll be able to see the possibility of attaining the same uh, kind of omniscient state that the Buddha himself has reached. And therefore, these uh, mental afflictions, the kleshas and the uh, their st residual stains called obscuration to knowledge are temporary, adventitious, and therefore, this clear light mind will ultimately become the Buddha's mind, mind of omniscience through the application of antidotes. Right now we may be within samsara, samsaric beings full of all kinds of negativities, but these negativities have their antidote and whereas they do not have a sound ground as such to stay forever in our mind, whereas if you reflect on the nature of clear light mind, the nature of clarity, uh, clarity and luminous mind, you'll be able to see the possibility of attaining and also understanding that the, the stains within our mind are temporary, then you'll be able to see that through antidotes, Applying antidotes, you'll be able to uh, cultivate the. I mean, by 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 cultivating uh, what are called the methods and wisdom uh, parts aspects of the practice, you'll be able to 
attain the same kind of mind, the omniscient, the all-knowing mind as like the Buddha himself has attained by overcoming these defilements that are within our minds through the application of their antidotes. So the mental afflictions and their uh, imprints or stains left by them are all adventitious, temporary, whereas the nature of mind itself is luminous, clear light. And therefore, though our mind right now it may be under the sway of ignorance, this basic clear light mind will turn into the mind of omniscience of a Buddha. So this, uncle this unclear mind eventually be becomes free from these defilements by applying our antidotes to them. And so the nature of the mind being luminous, whereas our uh, defilements are uh, temporary, and therefore we can see the possibility of attaining all-knowing mind of a Buddha because of the defilements being adventitious, whereas the basic nature, the intrinsic nature of the mind itself is luminous, clear light. So you should gain conviction in the, in the fact that the mind is its nature, in its nature, clear light or luminous, whereas the defilements the, which are adventitious can be gradually reduced and decreased within, from within our mind through the application of antidotes. From my own experience, by reflecting on bodhicitta and the view of emptiness, I can kind of uh, say that, uh, infer that these uh, defilements are temporary. So I accept that I lack the uh, single-pointed concentration or uh, shamatha. I can kind of infer that uh, the, the omniscience is possible and that I can reach the path of also the path of preparation, which is the second uh, stage within the five-tiered path. So, with regard to the antidotes to the defilements, they are twofold, bodhicitta and the insight into emptiness. So, their insight into emptiness serves as the antidote to the defilements and bodhicitta assists this wisdom of emptiness to uh, overcome the obscuration to knowledge. In other words, obscuration to uh, omniscience. So if you practice the path, the twofold path of method and wisdom, we can, uh, you can uh, see, you can have the confidence to reach the uh, state of Buddhahood, which the Buddha Shakyamuni himself has reached. So just as the Buddha has reached that goal, which is free from uh, Buddhahood, which is free from both the obscurations of afflictions and um, the, uh, the, the uh, cognitive obscurations, we should have the, that kind of a courage to reach that, the determination and courage to reach that goal. As it is said, the uh, Buddha's kayas, the enlightened body, shines forth to all sentient beings, and the basic mind of the, the sentient beings, this clear light mind, and the Buddha's omniscient mind in, the, in their basic nature 
uh, there is no difference. So this mind that we have now, the Buddha has said, this will turn into the omniscient mind of a Buddha. And so this is a very profound and a very powerful teaching. We should keep this in mind. As it is said that uh, by, Nagarju by um, Vasubandhu, that the teaching of the Buddha is twofold, the realization and the scriptural teachings. And to preserve them is through the, uh, only through the practice of teaching and practice. So we should engage in studying the teaching. And having learned them, we should practice the teaching itself. So merely by words, we cannot gain the realizations and overcome these uh, defilements of the obscurations to knowledge and the mental afflictions. But having learned the teaching, we should apply the teaching within ourselves so that we are able to uh, develop the uh, what opposes these defilements that are within ourselves. And these defilements themselves are without any sound ground. And therefore, you can see the temporality of this, uh, these defilements and the temporary nature of these defilements and that the uh, mind itself in its basic nature is luminous and clear light. So right now our minds may be full of these negativities, the defilements and so forth, but through the application of uh, the antidotes, the counterfactors, then this mind that we have now can be produced, I mean we can produce the omniscient mind from this mind that we have now and therefore we should have understanding based on learning and then the understanding or wisdom that arises through reflections and contemplation and then in the end uh, as to the best of your ability whatever you may be doing uh, sitting walking standing or lying down you will be able to see the You will be able to see how these defilements that are within our mind becomes less and less. So therefore, the state of purification, the purified state, uh, which is the, the, the purification of the two uh, obscurations, is something that is possible. So from my own side, of course, I, have, I do not have the single-pointed concentration called shamatha, but I can still uh, see the possibility that I may be able to attain uh, the path of preparation. So by overcoming, by, by applying the antidotes to the obscuration to uh, afflictions, and the obscuration to uh, uh, the knowledge, I can see that it's possible to attain that of Buddhahood. So the more you have, the, uh, the, the greater the understanding and insight into the selfless nature of, uh, selflessness nature of the uh, things and beings, the, the more you'll be able to see you are able to see the possibility of overcoming these defilements with, from within one's mind. Mana 
And so if we are able, I'm sorry, I got distracted by some knocking here. And uh, uh, Solomon was talking about the fact that this clear light nature of the mind uh, makes it possible for the uh, uh, obscuration to knowledge and the afflictive mental afflictions to be overcome and th therefore will be able to see the possibility to reach uh, omniscient nature of uh, the omniscient state of Buddhahood. And therefore the practice of bodhicitta by thinking and giving thoughts to it you'll be able to see that uh, uh, you'll be able to uh, attain your own goal as well as the uh, fulfill the goals of others. As we say in the prayer, in order to fulfill the aims of myself and others, I shall develop the spirit of enlightenment. And therefore, you should be, you should have this determination and the courage to uh, develop bodhicitta, this spirit of enlightenment, uh, day and night, as the prayer for Bodhisattva vows says, having developed the spirit of highest enlightenment, I shall invite all sentient beings as my guests. I shall enact the delightful supreme enlightened uh, practices. May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. So through this kind of practice, you'll be able to have this confidence to reach Buddhahood. So as Mudra Tantra says, all sentient beings are uh, endowed with the Buddha nature and the Buddha's kayas, the enlightened body of the Buddha shines forth and that the emptiness nature, uh, the emptiness nature of sentient beings and the Buddha's mind are same. So, from one's own side, one should develop bodhicitta to the best of one's ability and then tread the uh, tread along the path to enlightenment comprising those of the paths and the grounds of bodhisattvas and therefore we should have the determination and keep it in mind to to uh, uh, work for the benefit of all other sentient beings so keep that in mind please so the teaching today is uh, in praise of Dharma Dhatu. So there's something which, as long as left unknown, results in life's three planes of vicious circle. Beyond all doubt, it dwells in every being. To the Dharma Datu, I devoutly bow. And so, this Dharma Datu uh, is this Buddha nature, so which is within ourselves, all sentient beings. So, because of not understanding the degrees of subtlety within the mind, because and because of clinging on to some kind of self independent nature in things and beings we are ignorant and therefore circle in samsara so you should develop this understanding of uh, the, the emptiness uh, you uh, through study and then reflection and meditation so therefore so the uh, first uh, verse was read again, and so what this shows is that the empty nature of our mind and the empty nature of the Buddha's mind are same, whereas the Buddha went through the accumulation of merit and wisdom and thereby became someone 
who became free from the defilements. And therefore, regarding ourselves, we should, if we are able to uh, develop this uh, understanding uh, based on study, reflection and meditation, we will also be able to uh, overcome these defilements from within our minds and become omniscient. When that which forms the cause for all samsara is purified along the stages of the path, this purity itself is nirvana, precisely this, the dharmakaya, too. So by overcoming the defilements within our mind, the, which are adventitious, we uh, will be able to reach the nirvana and that uh, precisely is also cool, called the dharmakaya too. As butter, though inherent in the milk, is mixed with it and hence does not appear, just so the dharmadhatu is not seen as long as it is mixed together with afflictions, as just the inherent butter essence with the milk is purified is no more disguised. When afflictions have been completely purified, the dharmadhatu will be without any stain at all. So when you have this clinging to true existence and things and beings very strong, though the dharmadhatu, this basic element of the mind is there, the reality of the mind is there, but we are not able to become aware of it, but we see things as if they have some kind of objective independent existence. As a Buddha lamp that burns inside of us, our ways uh, would not even be slightly visible. As long as left inside of fiction's ways, the Dharma Datu is not visible. So with the uh, concentration which is like the Vajra, it is said that uh, uh, the Dharma Datu uh, as uh, so when you reflect on and meditate on the basic empty nature of the mind itself, you'll be able to see the groundlessness of these afflictions within ourselves, the obscurations or defilements, and therefore we will be able to have some confidence that it's possible to gain, uh, to attain the, uh, the Dharmakaya. So verse number five again. And verse number six, if one perforates the... Uh, verse number five done again. Verse number six, if one perforates the surface of the ways, uh, whatever holes are made in whichever directions through those and in precisely those directions, light will shine as is its nature too. At the moment when the Vajra like Samadhi is able to obliterate uh, the ways, at that very moment the light burning inside will shine through the, throughout the reaches of all space. So this clear light nature of the mind is its nature, the nature of the mind itself. And so though we are full of the negativities and defilements, that basic clear light nature is always there. The Dhammadatu was never born, verse number eight, nor will it ever cease. At all times it is free of all afflictions, at the beginning, middle and end, free from stain. As Sapphire, the precious gem, shines with brilliant light all the time, but when confined within a grosser stone, we do not see its bright light shine. Just so, although obscured behind afflictions, the Dharmadhatu has no trace of flaw. While samsara blocks its light, it does not illuminate. Nirvana gains. It, its light will brilliantly shine. So this basic clear light nature of the mind, when you reflect on it, you'll be able to see the temporary nature of the d afflictions, the d uh, defilements, and these defilements, 
you'll be able to see uh, how you should put effort in uh, developing the antidote to overcome the defilements. If the fundamental element is present, work will yield the sight of purest gold. If the fundamental element was lacking, the labor would produce no fruit but wool as kernels are not considered to be rice, as long as they are enveloped in their husks, just so the same, the name of Buddha is not given to all of those who, whom affliction still enfolds. So verse number 11, Done. So when you think about the clear light nature of the mind to overcome the defilements, you have to think about the empty uh, nature of the mind as well. Whatever we see, we see things and beings to have some kind of objective independent existence, but things and beings do not have that ex way of existence. But they, of course, have their effects. And therefore, the Madhyamaka view is very important to understand that things, to understand that things are merely de designated. Verse number 12, as kernels are not considered to be rice, as long as they are enveloped in their husk, just so the name of Buddha is not given to all the, those whom afflictions still unfold. And just as when loosened from the husk, the rice itself is what appears, just so the Dharmakaya itself, when loosened from afflictions, freely shines. Verse number 14, it is said, banana trees are void of pith. One uses this example in the world, but the fruit of such a tree has pith indeed. When eaten, it is sweet upon the tongue. Verse number 15, just so samsara has no pith, and if beings cannot remove afflictions, peel, afflictions peel the fruit within it, within Buddhahood is itself, the nectar of all corporal beings to taste. So the clear light nature of the mind, as long as it is enveloped by defilements, we are called sentient beings. Whereas through the application of antidote, when those uh, defilements are uh, removed, you become a Buddha. Verse number 18, although the sun and moon are unstained, five whales exist which manage to obscure them. These consist of clouds and fogs and smoke, the face of Rahu and dust as well. So with regard to verse number 19, there is this word second in the second line, um, and so it is well as well for mind's clear light. Five obscurations to manage to obscure it. Desire. So desire. Instead of desire, His Holiness says he has uh, changed it uh, in his text. He has uh, corrected it to me uh, uh, to um, uh, regret. So de instead of desire, please make it regret. Regret. Uh, Laziness, ill intent, and agitation too, as well as doubt. So all these defilements, such as the uh, defilements or this imprint of clinging to independent, independent uh, true existence, and that in turn is uh, removed through the application of antidote. And so you will be able to, uh, what you were saying is that we will be able to see that th things are empty of any intrinsic independent existence. Uh -huh. 
So verse number 23 done. Just as water deep inside the earth lies untouched and perfectly clean, just so can primordial awareness rest within afflictions and remain completely free of any flaw. The Dhammadhatu is not the self, it is neither man nor woman either, and being beyond everything perceive perceivable, just how could it be thought of as oneself? Verse number 25, within phenomena all uh, free of passion, male and female, cannot be seen. For the sake of taming those that desire blinds, terms like male and female are taught, impermanent and suffering and empty, three designations purifying mind. But what refines the mind unto its utmost is the teaching that nothing has any self-nature. As a child in a pregnant woman's womb is there and yet is not yet visible, likewise when covered by afflictions the Dhamma Dhatu is not visible. From thinking I and mine and from thinking the names and grounds of these four conceptual patterns come to be due to the elements and compounds too. So verse number uh, 10, uh, 30 just as the horns of rabbits' heads do not exist except in the imagination, phenomena are all precisely like that, merely imagined, having no existence. Because they are not made of solid atoms, the horns of oxen cannot be seen either. Since not even tiny atoms exist, how could one imagine that something made of atoms exists? So these uh, two verses show that, uh, the, that of the, uh, uh, the fact that things have no independent and objective existence since arising is dependent occurrence is a dependent occurrence and cessation is a dependent occurrence there is not one single thing that exists how could the naive believe that there is using examples like rabbits and oxen's horns both of which are characterized by imputation the, the the, thus Gon one has proven that all phenomena are nothing other than the middle way just as one sees the forms of sun, moon, stars reflected in vessels of perfectly clear water, so is the contamination, consummation of signs and characteristics. So this very mind which we have now, as long as it is enshrouded within the afflict, uh, the, the uh, defilements, we are sentient beings, whereas through the application of antidote, when these, uh, the, the, when the shroud is I mean, uh, uncovered, uh, the, uh, removed, then you are a body, uh, Buddha. So, verse number 37 was where His Holiness was uh, commenting. It says, those ensnared in the net of afflictions are referred to by the label sentient beings. The very same when feed, freed of states afflicted as Buddhas are revered. When I and form assume their right relation, Appearances appear without a blur. Since these are neither arise nor cease, they are the Buddha Dhammadhatu, though they are imagined to be otherwise. Verse number 43 is all this is there. So, the phenomena that appear through the mental consciousness, the chief of them all, are conceptualized and then superimposed. So, this shows that the things and the minds are all uh, merely designated. When the activity, when this activity is abandoned, the phenomena lack of self essence is known. Knowing this, meditate on Dharma Dhatu. Verse 44, and so is all that is seen or heard or smelt, tasted, touched or, and imagined when yogis and yoginis 
understand these in this manner, all this one, their wonderful qualities have brought to consummation perceptions, door of doors of eyes and ears and nose and tongue and body and the mental uh, gates. All these six are utterly pure. These consciousness, purity itself is suchness, defining suchness, uh, defining characteristics. See how the mind has two aspects. It can be worldly, it can, be, it can transcend the world. From clinging to a self comes samsara. When there is self-awareness, there is suchness. The seizing of desires nirvana, as is stupidities and angers and for these uh, to seize is Buddhahood itself, to refute the refuge of ennobled beings. One either proceeds with knowledge or proceeds without. Samsara and Nirvana both have their source in the body. Either you are bound by your own thinking or if you know the true nature, you are freed. Enlightenment is neither near nor far. It does not go away or come to you. Right there within the cage of your afflictions, either you will see it or you will not. Abiding in the lamp of Prajna, wisdom, uh, with, uh, will lead to peace, the most sublime there is. Examining the, uh, to, uh, for self is the way to abide. This is taught in scores of sutra texts. The strength, all ten, the strength, all ten, assist the immature with the blessing force like that of full moon. But as long as they are caught up in afflictions, beings will fail to see the dust gone once. Just as those in hungry spirits realm see the sea as dry before their eyes, just so with those in ignorance's grip who think the Buddhas don't exist. For lesser beings and those with lesser merit, no matter what transcendent conquerors do, it is like placing a precious jewel in the hands of someone never known to see. For beings who have as amassed sufficient merit, the signs are radiant with shining light. All 32 blades with brilliant glory, beings like these is but in Buddha's presence dwell. The projectors inhabit forms of bodily dimension for many kalpas and many yet to come. However, in order to tame disciples, they demonstrate different activities in the expanse that tames. If it, on definitely targeting its goal, consciousness engages in its object within the purity of self-awareness. The bodhisattvas grounds all inherently abide. So when you are able to understand that the afflictions, the defilements are temporary and that the, there is antidote to them, you'll be able to see the possibility to reach uh, enlightenment. And therefore it is said, so verse 61 says, uh, enlightenment should not be thought far off, nor should it be considered close at hand. When objects, sin six in kinds, do not appear, the genuine is known just as it is. Just as milk and water mix together at present in the very same container, but a crane would drink the milk and not the water. This case of transformation is like this. There is primordial awareness, there is covering afflictions, where both are found together in one body, but the primordial awareness is what yogis and yoginis choose to take and leave the ignorance behind. For as long as I and mine are held to exist, and the outside is, and the outside is imagined as well, when both forms of selflessness are seen, the seed of, of existence is destroyed. The Dharmadhatu is ground is the ground for Buddhahood, Nirvana, purity and permanence. The immature impute the two kinds of self and yogis and yoginis abide without these two. In giving one endures a range of hardships, in uh, ethics gathers, 
In the benefit of beings through patience, one performs the good of all. The, these three will cause the potential to unfold. So verse number 72, his holiness is there, 73, 75, the Bodhicitta perfectly engendered through its stable and consistent dedication to the Buddha, the Dharma and to Sangha does not decrease and develops more and more. 78. When there, when the four meaner deeds have been relinquished and the four better deeds have been embraced, just then is this thatness definitely realized. This is what the joyful thorough signif thoroughly signifies. The stained are those whom shifting patterns mark with the constant stains of desire and the rest. Whoever has grown free of flaw is pure, and this is what is the stain that signifies. Once afflictions net is rent asunder, a flawless wisdom shines, and with its light purifies all darkness past all limit, removing it, and hence illuminates. It shines with light that is always pure, primordial awareness, which eliminates diversion, is steeped in light which shines on every side. This Bhumi hence is known as radiant, since awareness, feeds and crafts are mastered here. Verse number 85, it says definitely uh, guided by the Buddhas in contact with primordial awareness, see, awareness, see, spontaneous and free of any effort, unshaken by the Mara's excellence. Since yogis and yoginis at this level have perfected the dialectics used to teach all points connected with precise, correct awareness, it takes the name select intelligence. The body at this point is made of primordial awareness, is equal to the unpolluted sky, the vigilance afforded by the Buddha, Buddha's forms, Buddha's forms, uh, the cloud of Dharma everywhere, the ground of the qualities of the Buddhas, the fruits of training fully held in hand, the transformation when perfectly completed is given Dharmakaya as its name. Samsara's tendencies are ponderable. Freedom from tendencies is not. You are completely inconceivable. Who could ever have the power to know you? beyond the pale of speech entirely and not an object's senses, powers grasp. Realizing you takes the mind's awareness. I bow in praise of that you embrace. The illustrious heirs of Buddhas, by following their path step by step with the primordial awareness that attends the clouds of Dharma, can see emptiness and pure mode of being. As soon as mind has utterly been cleansed, samsara's cage, a confined, caged confinement broken through, these will then assume their rightful place upon a wondrous lotus flower seat, utterly surrounded by all sides, on all sides by lotus flowers, many tens of millions, each endowed with tantalizing anthers, their leaves alight with many precious gems. The Buddhas of ten, with ten powers are replete their fearlessness sets others' minds at ease. Their qualities are inconceivable. From the simplicity's domain, they never fall. Through excellently practicing all paths, they have gathered merit, garnered wisdom full. So they are like the harvest moon on high, surrounded by its court, the clustered stars. With a hand like the sun, 
Buddha holds a flawless gem with lighter blades. With this, the enlightened one empowers the most senior heirs, the Abhishek's greatest of them all. The mighty yogis and yoginis reaching living. So by while uh, totally uh, absorbed in emptiness, it is said that the Buddhas can uh, serve the, uh, uh, to benefit sentient beings. At the same time, without moving from that Dharmakaya the, uh, state, so when the Dharmakaya is seen in all its purity, this transformation, the final verse, verse number one in 101, this transformation, wisdom see, and from its depth, a wealth of precious jewels fulfill beings' needs as they have always wished. In praise of the Dharma Dhatu, composed by the great Acharya, Nagarjun uh, is hereby completed. So though uh, they have our three poisons of desire, hatred, and uh, ignorance are very powerful. However powerful they may be, we can still overcome them by uh, applying the antidote. So that shows that these are not uh, permanent, but um, uh, temporary, and therefore, if you are able to cultivate and apply the antidote, the counteracting force to these defilements, you'll be able to see that these can be overcome, the defilements, and therefore you'll be able to have the confidence within yourself to achieve such a goal of enlightenment through the application of these antidotes to over, by which overcomes and eradicates all the defilements from within one's mind. So here we are now gathered in this very holy sacred place of uh, Vajrasana, the diamond seat, and we have uh, this opportunity to uh, go through this teaching on the in praise of Dharma Dhatu. So I have received the transmission of this text and we have just gone through it roughly. On my part, I do my best to reflect on and uh, practice the uh, bodhicitta, the spirit of enlightenment and the insight into emptiness. And I would like to urge my Dharma friends, all you Dharma friends also to do the same and to the best of your ability. And so it is not meant just for this life alone, but until the space comes to an end, to work for the benefit of all sentient beings who are as...